Well, let's start with the market action. Weakness across Asia and Europe rubbed off on the last street where shares were largely under pressure. But we did see a recovery after a sharp fall in opening trade. At the end, the Sensex and the Nifty lost nearly half a percent. All sectoral indices were closing in the red today, barring the Nifty IT index. In fact, staying with markets, net inflows into equity mutual funds have more than doubled in September. That's compared to August with more than 14,000 crore rupees in inflows. The net equity inflows was the highest in the last three months. SIP inflows also remain steady at nearly 13,000 crore rupees. In the currency market, the rupee remains under pressure with the dollar strengthening on the back of higher crude oil prices. The Indian currency opened at its historic low of 82.62 against the dollar. It did recover some of those losses and finally closed flat at 82.32 against the dollar. There was, of course, signs of RBI intervention pulling the rupee off its intraday low. Earnings season is upon us and TCS has kicked things off on a positive note. The IT majors reported an all-round beat, both in terms of profit, revenue and margin. Quarterly profits for TCS crossing 10,000 crore rupees for the very first time. Margins have expanded to 24%. But attrition continues to rise and has hit 21.5% in the second quarter. TCS has also announced a dividend of 8 rupees a share. Rima standing by with the TCS Q2 report card. Rima. Thanks so much for that. TCS Q2 surpassing expectations in both revenues, margins, constant currency revenue growth at 4%, EBIT margins at 24%, expanding by 90 basis points, again, higher than street expectations. Uh, the company's one orders worth $8.1 billion in the quarter gone by, similar to what they had in the last quarter. So that's a positive because the street was worried that uh, with uh, the challenging macros that we're currently in, the deal wins could show an impact. That's not been the case this time. In fact, the two troubled verticals, Europe as well as UK, have shown close to about a 15% year-on-year revenue growth. The only worrying point has been the hiring numbers. Hiring for TCS is sub 10,000. This is a big drop-off compared to the hiring numbers that they had in the prior quarters. Why is that? That's point number one. And secondly, attrition has gone up even further, 21.5% but the management is fairly confident that attrition has picked out. In a nutshell, TCS has delivered um, you know, and beaten street expectations on both revenues as well as margins. So at least for now, this should allay street concerns. There is an increasing sense of caution that is in the discussions that we sense. But uh, we have told you last time that it is not yet materialized into our uh, order pipeline. And that continues to be the case now also. So there is, uh, there is that increasing sense of caution. There is that increasing sense that we, we need to be wary of uh, uncertainties. However, I believe there is space if we are uh, staying close to find opportunities for growth. But will we be totally insulated? Very difficult to say. Well, that is TCS with its second quarter numbers and all-round beat coming in. Brokerage firm Nomura has downgraded India's FI24 GDP forecast to 5.2%. However, its growth expectation for FI23 is in line with RBI's revised forecast of 7%. Nomura says India's optimism for FI24 may be, and I quote, misplaced, and the spillover effects from the global slowdown are being underestimated. Shares of Tata Motors under pressure today after its subsidiary Jaguar and Land Rover reported a 5% drop in sales for Q2. The drop is being largely attributed to the semiconductor shortage as well as the macroeconomic situation and COVID lockdowns across China. But back home, good news for Motown. Auto dealers say that they are witnessing strong sales amidst the festive season. According to the Federation of Auto Dealers Association of FADA, Sales for the Navratri period rose by 9, 57% versus 2021 and up by 16% versus 2019. Almost all categories have shown strong growth, including two-wheelers. The big global story, Russian missiles struck several Ukrainian cities, including the capital Kiev, days after an explosion on the Kerch Bridge, which links mainland Russia to the annexed Crimean Peninsula. Dozens of missiles were launched reportedly from the Black Sea that hit Kiev, which came under attack for the first time since June. The Russian retaliation comes after President Vladimir Putin called the attack on the Kerch Bridge an act of terror. Speaking just a short while back, Putin warned of a harsh response if Russia comes under attack. Ukrainian President Zelensky has accused Russia of trying to wipe his country off the face of the earth. He will hold talks with G7 leaders tomorrow. Cal Perry gets us more.
So this was a massive volley of rocket fire striking across the country. At least 83 rockets and or drones reported by Ukrainian defense officials. Some 41 of them shot out of the air. So about a 50 percent rate there of shooting out uh, those rockets and drones. The other half, of course, impacting their targets. Some of those targets, residential targets, you can see there on the left side of your screen, or excuse me, on the right side of your screen. That is aftermath from the Capitol here this morning. At least eight people dead in the Capitol. Another two dozen wounded. We're told that there are still some people stuck under rubble. Rescue services obviously trying to make their way to those scenes now. To the eastern part of the country, the city of Kharkiv taking a number of strikes as well. The city of Rivni in the center of the country, at least five dead there. That death toll expected to rise. And all the way to the west of the country, the city of Lviv, normally a calm city, some hundreds of miles away from the fighting. Strikes taking place there, hitting infrastructure targets. The power in that city at this hour, we understand, is out. Right now, where I am in the capital, the streets are deserted. People are huddled in the subway. The mayor says he expects more attacks to take place. As you said, these are the first strikes in and around the capital since June. That was the last time we had these strikes. This follows that strike on the bridge in Crimea. People expected there to be some kind of reaction, but this is a very, very large response indeed. Cal reporting there from Kyiv. Now, the number of children who have died on account of taking in contaminated cough syrup made by India's maiden farmer has risen to 69. A report by The Wire claims the World Health Organization did not certify maiden farmer's plant as claimed on the company's website. The farmer exporter's body has suspended the company. Our colleague Abhimanyu Sharma reports from maiden farmer's offices in Delhi, which were a deserted look. This is the Delhi office of the pharma company Maiden Pharmaceuticals, which has come under scanner after 66 children died in Gambia after consuming cusp syrups which were produced by the company. While the company has expressed shock over the incident, it has claimed that it has been working since the past three decades as per the protocols laid down by the central and Haryana state regulator and is cooperating with all the relevant authorities. The pharma exporter's body, Farmexil, has also suspended Maiden Pharmaceuticals, which has been warned of illegal practices by the state governments of Gujarat and Kerala in the past, as its medicines had failed to meet the standard quality tests. When we visited Maiden Pharmaceuticals' office in Delhi, the company officials said that no one from the senior management was present, and they pointed to the notices which were pasted outside their office. One was a medical product alert against substandard pediatric medicines by the WHO, while the second was an order by the Medicines Control Agency in Gambia to suspend and recall all products of Maiden Pharmaceuticals, while the company's website had claimed that one of its plants was certified by the World Health Organization. WHO had told The Wire that it had not certified or inspected any of the plants of Maiden Pharmaceuticals. Well, that is the important clarification that has come in from the WHO. As we've been reporting, Maiden Pharma has a controversial track record. Reports quoting the World Health Organization indicate that the UN agency had never certified Maiden Pharma's plant. Maiden Pharma was in fact one of the 46 Indian companies blacklisted by Vietnam in 2013. Ekta Batra joins us now with more on what has been a series of repeat incidents of substandard drugs. As per a report by The Wire, the World Health Organization has said it never certified Maiden Pharma's plants. Also, the report indicates that the contaminants of the drug by Maiden Pharma were so poisonous as per the WHO that it resulted in an 85% fatality rate. And most of the children who were impacted by the four cough and cold syrups produced by Maiden Pharma and exported to Gambia were below two years of age. This issue continues to raise concerns and questions. For example, while the company did not have a license to sell these four cough and cold drugs in India, were there enough red flags to have averted this incident? For example, the company which started operations as per its website in 1990 was one of the 46 Indian companies blacklisted by Vietnam in 2013. The company had six of its drugs such as diabetes medicine, metformin, vitamin D and calcium tablets and blood thinner aspirin that have 
have been reported as substandard since 2015 by drug regulators from Kerala and Gujarat. Many of these cases of substandard drugs were reported in the past few months. So how did their lax manufacturing go unnoticed by authorities? Legal experts point to a couple of issues. One is of too many regulators. While any new drug in the country gets approved by the central authority, the Drug Controller General of India or the DCGI, the older drugs, which are anything more than four years, are governed by state regulators. Also, a regulator of one state cannot inspect the facility of a pharma company in another state unless the regulator of that state is on board. And many states have different licensing procedures and approval processes. Hence, there is a lack of central coordination or authority which can take a collective call on substandard production with companies then getting away with lax processes. Experts point out that for India, there is an urgent need to have a common regulatory authority, possibly on the same lines as the US drug regulator. One needs to at least centralize the licensing process for manufacturing facilities and have transparent processes as well. And while creating a centralized authority might come with its own challenges, lastly, the industry watchers, experts say it is time to bridge the gap when it comes to India's pharma industry. While on one hand, we are exporting over $20 billion of pharma drugs globally, with the largest geography of US FDA compliant plants outside of the US, on the other hand, we have seen five cases of DEG poisoning alone, with the latest case in India just two years ago in 2020. Ekta, many thanks for joining us. Several regulatory lapses that need to be plugged. The quick check of some of the other headlines tonight. JP Associate has moved to cut its debt burden. The board has approved the sale of its cement assets, including a grinding unit in Madhya Pradesh worth around 5,000 crore rupees. The Delhi High Court has ordered global personal care major L'Oreal to pay 186 crore rupees for failure to pass on the GST rate cuts to consumers, upholding the findings of the National Anti-Profiteering Authority. Now, here's an important story. The union government is deliberating new rules to curb cases of check bouncing. Sources say a check bounce could now be treated on par with a loan default. Sapna Das is here with more. Sapna, take us through what the government is considering. Well, uh, definitely these are suggestions that have come in from various quarters, uh, some including also banking entities, and these are ongoing deliberations. But having said that, a uh, couple of uh, important highlights. Number one, of course, uh, the suggestion for treating a check bounce as a loan default. Uh, you know, this could be very significant because uh, a loan default is on a very different scale in comparison to a check bounce uh, right now. Uh, there are not too many penal provisions for a check bounce case uh, as of now. And uh, if you look at the Negotiable Instruments Act uh, section 135, uh, I think that leaves ample space uh, for some further action and that's what probably the government is hinting towards as of now. That's one. Second, uh, also in terms of uh, you know, uh, getting the power to debit the other accounts of the issuer who has given the check that has bounced. Uh, that could again be very important. And last but not the least, also options like uh, either a complete ban or some kind of restrictions or restraint uh, on those account holders who issue such checks which bounce, uh, basically, you know, uh, barring them from opening new accounts. Uh, that, of course, goes against the uh, current spirit of uh, expansion of the banking services all over the country. But uh, this may be an important punitive measure uh, if, if the instances of check bounces don't come down uh, in the courts. Uh, that's what the government is trying to address. Uh, there is, they'll also have to examine the legal feasibility of all these options mm -hmm. which are under discussion right now. Uh, maybe some amend amendments to the Negotiable Instruments Act uh, may have to be proposed. So that's something we'll have to wait and watch and see. Uh, once the legal feasibility has been examined, I think this may go forward. So this is what we have as of now, but uh, all eyes on this story. It's a developing story. It is a developing story. Sapna, many thanks for joining us. Now, the former chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, along with American economist Douglas Diamond and Philip Dibbig, have won the Nobel Prize for Economics. The trio were honored for their research on banks and financial crises. Steve Leesman is here with more on why Bernanke and the two others won the coveted prize over other nominees. Steve. I think the debate is going to be about the extent to which the, what he did in 2008 warrants the prize. But I think it's important to point out that's not what he got the prize for. Bernanke was like 28 and then 30 years old when he wrote the papers that I think they're talking about, they are talking about in this, which is he changed our understanding of the Great Depression, right? Schwartz and Friedman come along and they say this is because the Fed screwed up on monetary policy. Bernanke comes later and says, yeah, you guys are right, but there was this other element to it. And this other element is that the banking system shut down. 
And so if you're going to have a recession and you want to get out of it quickly, yeah, you got to get monetary policy right, but you also have to watch the financial channels uh, that, that are out there. And that's what led to what happened, I think, in 08, not, not, not I think for sure, that Bernanke was faced with uh, what he had studied when he was, you know, uh, in his 20s and, and early 30s uh, and said, you know what, this is the paper that I wrote and this is what we need to do, which is we to make sure that we don't have a banking panic. Steve Leesman, many thanks for joining us. We will head into a break, but up next, Rajasthan starts vaccinating cattle for the lumpy skin disease, but there's still no clarity on the efficacy of the shots. A special report from Jodhpur when we return. You <laughs> 